This is Dave Stone with his song Simple Life on Tell Craig Your Story Podcast. Search out the simple life Search out the sun Think I might head north Don't hope, just go for a run Get away from the muck in the air And the, the peak I was with This on the margin low And the, the credit card debt I'll search out the simple life Take a sip in the sun Sit back, relax, unwind Go to almost home Get away from the mark in the air And the, the peak I was sweat Peace on the margin, Lord And the credit card day
Hi guys, Craig here. Welcome to another edition of the podcast, Tell Craig Your Story. Today we'll be speaking to singer-songwriter and recording artist Dave Stone. Now Dave is born in Taree, Australia. He grew up uh, in the Central Coast, uh, now living in Shanghai. Now Dave got his big break in 2005 where he got to play at the World Expo in Japan, representing Australia. And he played at the Japan Blues Festival. In 2010, he represented Australia and played at the Shanghai World Expo. And he was also working for Tourism Australia. Now, Dave has also played at the the legendary Cotton Club in Shanghai. And he's a part of the musicians at the Pearl Theatre. And Dave is the lead guitarist of the ACDC tribute band here where he dresses up as Angus Young. It's an amazing show if you're ever in the Shanghai and you get to see uh, the ACDC tribute show, uh, please go ahead and watch it. Dave has also brought out a album, Money Breeds Flies. We heard the first track from that album at the start of the podcast, Simple Life. And at the end of the podcast, we'll listen to River. For the second part of the podcast, Myself and Dave are huge ACDC fans, and I set a goal out for Dave where if Angus Young came up to us and said, hey, can you make a set list uh, for a show, Uh, what songs would you like to hear? So uh, me and Dave uh, sit down and we go through our 20 songs that have inspired us, and songs that we would like to hear that they normally don't play live. But before we go, please go to our website. We're at Podbean. Tell Craig your story at podbean.com. We also have a YouTube channel there. Make sure you're subscribing to get all the latest updates. We have VK for our Russian listeners and WeChat for our Chinese listeners at Tell Craig Your Story. We also have a link tree there which tells you where... Tell Craig Your Story podcast is streaming. We are streaming on all the major streaming services. All right, here we go. This is my chat with Dave Stone on Tell Craig Your Story podcast. Hi, Dave. How are you doing today? Pretty good, thanks, Craig. Or should I call you Colin? <laughs> That's a little, <laughs> a little in joke. You can tell us about okay, that. Okay, so when I met, first met Craig at the Pearl, I don't know what show we were doing, but maybe ACDC or something. I, Craig introduced himself as Craig, obviously, and I kept calling him Colin all <laughs> night, and he kept correcting me it was Craig. I still wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't remember it. And then the next week I come and I was like, hey, Colin, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you probably replied, good, thanks, but it's Craig. Yeah, it's Craig, yeah. <laughs> Thank you much for your time. We're at the very legendary, famous... She's been doing it for 17 Cotton. years. Oh, the third level? Fourth level? Uh, yeah, Cotton's Restaurant. Cotton Club's different, but... The Attic. We're in the Attic. Yes. Lots of people outside enjoying a beverage, and uh, you just finished up a, a set. I did. And how did that go? Good. Every Saturday and Sunday, if the weather's nice, because it's a beautiful garden here, we try and have live music. We have a, a sort of a, a different schedule of different artists that will come in and perform. Right. Um, so you just played a three-hour set, right? Yeah. So what music uh, do you incorporate into that three-hour set? Obviously, it'd be covers, but do you throw some of your originals in there? Yes. So I, I mix it around. Gen- generally, start off slow because this is a, a restaurant vibe. Yeah, true. And people are eating, and they're not here to see my music. Yes definitely mix it up with covers and then I'll throw some originals in there as well and right. hopefully people will like it. Right. I've also seen you play like at the pool. We'll get more into that. First question I want to ask is uh, COVID. How did it affect you? Uh, what did you have to cancel? And you were telling me today that you actually went back to Australia, right? So tell Yeah, us, tell so us COVID, I went back to Sydney, stayed with my mum for a week. This is pre-COVID, so this was January, and my wife and I went back there um, for a holiday, huh. and we're th- I want to move back to Australia in the future, so we're having a sniff around for different places. Um, 
where we'd like to go and that. Mm-hmm. And so we went back to Sydney. Then we, I oh, know, we went up to Byron Bay. Saw my sister. We had a bit of a family family reunion up there. Mm. Um, even though I'm from the Central Coast originally, my sister's moved up there, and my dad's thinking of moving up there because you know, in Sydney's just pretty expensive now. Yeah. So very. and then we drove up to the uh, Sunshine Coast after being in Brisbane and just had a look around and then COVID hit and then because of the businesses here my wife freaked out um, because the landlord always wants his rent just like the bank does (laughs) so she came back in February and then I thought I'd stay work on my album and then also catch up with some mates Mm. being alone that's good to do Yes. and then um, I thought I'd try and find some work as well and then sort of COVID really hit and the shit hit the fan and um, there wasn't really much work at all and then uh, my wife rings up and said there was she had a bit of a medical emergency so can you come back and I got a just got a flight and uh, a week later they closed off the borders right so uh, it had I not got on that plane I would have been stuck in Sydney for a long time and I can think of some worse places in Sydney. Well, I, look, <laughs> I personally would rather be there right now as well, being married. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So for you, what was it like living in Shanghai at that time? I mean, like... Uh, uh, okay, yeah, so I came back on the 18th of March. Right. And there was no music work going on. Yeah. But I was just happy to be, be, be back with my wife after she had to go to hospital and everything. And she right. wanted to be around. So yeah. first two weeks were quarantine. Which actually, I really enjoyed quarantine. Me too. So here's my story. With so I got a cold. I was I was hanging out at the pub pretty much every day. Um, <laughs> so my local is 92 steps from home. Come on. <laughs> Depend not 92 steps before. <laughs> Could be a little, a little bit more on the way home, but you know. Um, <laughs> sideways. Yeah, and, yeah. Sideways, wrong street. Yeah, um, going so, backwards. Happens. So anyway, and one of my mates had had a cold, and I managed to get it. I was actually going, and I got stuck in the rain for about half an hour. A day after that, I was going for a walk mm. just to get some fresh air before we came back to Shanghai. Yeah, I got a cold. I had to make that plane. I knew it wasn't wasn't COVID because at the time in in that area, there's no cases or anything and it's different symptoms right anyway long story short I made the plane I got on the plane I went through all the checks of four different temperature checks and I did have cold and flu medicine right I was I thought okay if there's any time in my life that I've got to be really honest about everything yeah it's now yeah definitely so I filled out the form I said yes I had had a cold in the um, in the last two weeks I had taken cold and flu medicine my symptoms was just a headache, a sore throat or something. I can't right. remember what it was. Anyway, so they they tested me at the airport after lining up for six hours. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, and they took me off to a different area, and I got a I got a red stamp. No. Oh. So I I came back negative for COVID at the airport, um, but just to be safe, they. I hung around for another two hours waiting for an ambulance. So I got my own personal ambulance, so I I felt like a star. (laughs) And they took me in an ambulance straight to a quarantine hospital. Yeah, right. Wow. And um, they wouldn't let me pick up my luggage. So I had a $5,000 guitar in my suitcase. And I was really worried about the guitar going, you know, on a walkabout Mm, by itself. Yes. And I was up all night. I, I think I was without 24 hours, I was... I had I was awake the whole plane trip, tw- and I they uh, I had some water on the plane, but they uh, didn't give me any water at the airport. Get to the quarantine hotel, just checks all night. You go to different mm. facilities for the CAT scan and the blood test and the throat swabs and this and that. Yeah, right. And I was bun- I was with a bunch of different Chinese students that had just come back, mm. and I thought, geez, this is a really good place to catch it if someone else is going. Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> Anyway, so I can't. Um, they then put me, locked me in a room um, for the next three days, like electronic locks and everything. Yeah. There was no toilet paper. There was no drinking water. There was no towels. I didn't have my luggage. Jeez. Um, 
and in China here we use this thing called WeChat Pay. So, and I didn't have any money, WeChat Pay money, only mm. cash, right? Yeah. So um, I couldn't order any of the luxuries like water or, or toilet paper. And thankfully, my wife organised that and it got delivered. Right. So I was in my same I was in my same undies for five days. <laughs> <laughs> I well, same everything really, and it was pretty cold too. So, but you know, I made the best of a bad situation and daydreamed a lot. And, yeah. Um, Is this where you're writing new material, coming up with new ideas? Yeah, the fourteen day fever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Give me a classic. Yeah, my brother-in-law picked up my luggage at the airport, and he brought that over. And so then I got my guitar and I got stuck into some, right. some slide guitar. It was a nice mm. resonator. A nice yeah. resonator guitar. So you weren't allowed to have your guitar in the quarantine period? No, well, they wouldn't let me pick it up. And right. It was really sensitive who's coming in and who's coming yeah, out. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It was so, pretty hardcore there at that, that time. They were really sensitive at that time. Yeah. Where I did mine in late October. It was still the same, but, uh, you know, I was in a five-star hotel with like a like a being able to get like anything from the restaurant i was like this is great you know brand new hotel i was like yeah yeah let, let me stay for another week <laughs> you gotta come back yeah um, no i was really enjoy after i got my guitar and my computer yeah i was really enjoying it yeah um because i wasn't being bugged by anybody it's true yeah i mean the problem was Obviously, my wife was ill, and I was in mm. Shanghai. I was like, I felt so close, but so far at the same time. Yes, that was the hard thing looking out the window. But um, I just did a heap of guitar practice and a bit of writing. Great. That's what I did with my time. So absolutely, uh, there was no no booze allowed, no cigarettes. Mm. How was that for you? Going so, two weeks without cigarettes. Well, actually, actually, I hope my mother's not listening, but. Um, <laughs> I had I, I came prepared and my fr my friend I actually had five packets of uh, drum rollies, <laughs> rolly tobacco. Right. Yeah. And so what I did was, and I had um, got my my brother in law to put some cigarettes in the in the suitcase. Yeah. In the little front po pockets, and they, he just brought it in, and I had I used the uh, the manhole in the in the bathroom. I sort of hid it up there in case they came and did a room check. Yeah. And just sort of breathed out in and out the window. So I had my own little stash and another little stash hidden somewhere. And it was what kind a, of exciting, you know. What a professional. <laughs> hey, you can learn a lot, a lot of movies, there right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. What an experience. And then, like, uh, living in uh, in Shanghai in this time, especially for the people, like, uh, in Australia, like, it's very different. Um, so what was it like living in Shanghai during this time? Did you have any, you know, it was lockdown. When did they start... Was it May, June, July that they started to sort of... Yeah, so I didn't have any music work for months. So what were you doing for, like, an income? Savings. Savings, wow. Which I didn't have a lot of. Mm. And then, what? so what I did with my time, actually, was I did a... I'm a carpenter by trade. Right. So I did carpentry on the Central Coast and Newcastle for eight years. Come on. With different builders. And so she... her Both her restaurants are outdoor restaurants. So mm. I was... They were closed for a little period, um, but so, so uh, after I got out of quarantine, I always had food to eat. Right. It's a good thing about having a wife in the restaurant. Yes. Um, and so I just redid all the decks. So when did this come back? When were you able to start getting people to come back to the Clinton restaurant? I think it was only closed for about a month. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. That's... Uh... And then they, they slowly opened it up to like 10 people per night and... It oh, yeah. sort of took off from there. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, but then back to the music work. Yeah, I started playing with a blues band once or twice a week. Yeah. Um, the Pearl opened up. And then when it reopened, there were really strict measures at first. And then it, there weren't really any cases here, so it was everything was pretty relaxed and it was busier than the mm. year before. Yeah, yeah. So, and ever since then, I've just been flat out. Let's go back to Australia, back to your family, and back to where you grew up. So, did you, did you, were you born in the Central Coast? No, I was born in Taree. 
When it's hot, right? Right. You know what that is? Yeah. Yeah, just it's south just of um, Port Macquarie. Yeah. So I was my great parent, little spot. My grandmother was born up in um, my dad's mother was born up in Upper Lansdowne. That's right. kind of not far from there. So for our international listeners, whereabouts is Taree compared to Sydney? Before the highway, it was six hours north <laughs> from the Pacific <laughs> Highway, before the freeway. So uh, it's probably about four, hour, four hours north, forgive me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the new... And I drive slower, right? Yeah, so it's about four hours north of Sydney. Yeah. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah. So I was born up there, and then we moved to the Central Coast when I was seven. Right. To a place called... We first moved... I think we moved to a place called Yamina. Yamina, right. Yemina. Right. So we moved there and rented there for a year or two, and then um, Saratoga, which is next to Davistown, and then my dad bought a block of land at a place called McMaster's Beach. Ah, oh, right. And I lived there most of the time. We were talking about that before. Like I had some uh, relatives that used to live there as well. But anyway, uh, were your mum and dad like musically? Were they part of music scene? Did they listen to music? Did they play music? Were they part of the entertainment industry? No. No? Um, my, well, how did you get involved with the, the music? My grandfather. Right. Actually, both my grandfathers. So, my um, grandfather, Tom Stone, he was a jazz drummer. Right. He, he was really musical, played the, played the spoons. Oh, come on. Um, yeah, and then played the drums and harmonica, ukulele. Yeah, right. And then my other grandma, uh, grandfather, George Evans... He just had he had this massive record collection. Two two top blokes. Yeah. Yeah, he was a good he was a mechanic and just a good guy. Mm. And um, he had this massive record collection. So I remember as a kid What he, was in he, his he, record he, collection? Uh, everything from oddly enough, Jimi Hendrix. Come on. Jimi Hendrix or a heap of jazz records to mm. Susie Quattro. Nice. Um, a lot of compilation records. I think I even got a Smurfs record. <laughs> <laughs> so just heaps of different stuff. Liberty Valance, Road to Town. I, I can't even remember half the names, but yeah. I've still got them all. Well, now yeah, I've right. uh, moved on. Um, so you have in- inherited both collections from both grandfathers, which is really cool. That's really cool. And that's what got you, like, started your introduction into music, right? Yeah, I guess. And then piano lessons as a kid at school. Right. And then guitar lessons, As a, I got kicked out of the guitar lesson group because right. I wasn't listening to the teacher oh. and distracting the other students. Oh. I wanted to play like Chuck, Chuck Berry. Right. So you're a bit of a bad boy at school, right? Huh? Not really. I just didn't listen to the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I was just having fun. Yeah. Well, I was a pretty good kid. Yeah. Where did you graduate on the Central Coast? Yep. I graduated at Central Coast Grammar School. Right. Yeah. And uh, did you have any sort of bands bands there at that time? Or were you still yeah. sort of l- learning how to play? Or? No, I kind of started off in the school band from a pretty young age. Um, I think I started guitar at 9 or 10, around there. And then my parents couldn't... I got lessons till I was 12, maybe 14, and my parents couldn't afford it anymore. Right. I just was on my own from there. But I, by that time, did you sort of have... You know, you gotta play the chord yeah. progressions and yeah, and like at school we had, at school we used to learn learned a lot of each other from different kids at that age. So what sort of music were you listening to at that that sort of time in high school? Yourself? I got into ACDC. Right. So I went into the school library and there was like the best of Australian rock or something like that, and there was Cold Chisel on there, ACDC, maybe the Skyhooks. Everything else never really stood out, so I can't remember. Mm. Billy Thorpe, mm. those texts. So I, I, oh, when, I first ha- when I first ha- heard ACDC, I just like, whoa. Yeah. It was a real eye, eye opener. Even guitar lessons, with, you know, I got stuck into uh, the Screaming Jets, the, oh. Angel, the Angels. The Newey, Newey bands. Yeah. Come on. All that kind of stuff. But then when I heard ACDC, I was like, I didn't look back. And then one of my best friends, uh, Michael O'Reilly, O'Reilly his brother Terry had a uh, the TNT album, the Aussie one, right on vinyl, and then I remember listening through that, and I was listening to this song called "The Jack." I've gone, 
was only 16 or 14 or uh, somewhere around there, you know. What? Who is Jack? <laughs> she's got the Jack. I'm thinking... Who is... I kept playing the song over and over and over, right? <laughs> and I said to my... Uh, actually, this, oh, this is a pretty cool period. I had a pool table in my room, a drum kit, my guitar set up, a record player. And I said to Dad, I said... Dad, I swear this song has two meanings. It's not can't be just about a card game. He goes, I can't remember his exact words, but he's like, yeah, son, that's Australian for gonorrhea. <laughs> or something along, along, along those lines. Well, I thought, what's gonorrhea? What's gonorrhea? <laughs> <laughs> what's sex? <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, wow. I just like the music. Yeah, of course. How could you not? It's so, so catchy and just those albums are just, yeah, mind-blowing. So... You graduated, like, again, what were you, the bands that you were playing in? Like, just school bands? Just school bands. Um, any any that sort of stick out? Names? Did you do any recordings with those bands? No. I did, I think one of my really good friends at the time, Michael Stewart, he, um, his brothers were very good musicians, including him. Right. Just geniuses, the whole... So I think at 14, we started jamming all the time, and we started playing around different little school parties and this and that. They were some of the best times of my life, actually. So, yeah, we'd go to the beach and, and play a lot of music. And I learnt a lot from them, actually, come to think of it. Right. They, they had a band, and uh, they, they were recording. They did everything on those Tascam 8-tracks. Oh, right, yeah. They, they had a lot of good songs, actually. And then they went into another studio on the Central Coast and recorded that. But unfortunately, they... Fizzles part, out. Fizzled out or part of ways or something. Mm. Yeah, I hope to do girls that. I hope get involved and the beach gets involved and I think so. I think I think Michael moved away and I didn't have a car. Right. And then you know he got a girlfriend and whatever. That's and it. You just what's the priority? <laughs> I never really saw him much for years. Yeah. yeah. I hope he's doing well. Yeah. What about the Central Coast music scene at that time? Was it was it a good music scene? Could you get regular gigs there or you know? Tell us a I, didn't, bit about I didn't really play much around there. I went and saw music. Right. Um, so what ha- what happened to me was I then did an exchange program to Japan. Right. So after I graduated, it just appealed to me because we had exchange students at our school, and um, I didn't learn. I didn't take Japanese at school. In fact, I didn't want to do Year Eleven and Twelve. I just wanted to do a trade. Yeah. So what was your and trade? Carpentry. Carpentry, right. And then my parents invite, really highly advised me to do it. They said, look, you can always go and do a trade after. Yes. My dad was a builder for 40 years. And what did your mum do? Worked at Grace Brothers. And uh, she's now a real estate agent. So oh, back nice. then she just worked in Grace Brothers. Yeah. And did you have any brothers or sisters as well? Yeah, younger sister, Stephanie, younger brother, Mitchell, I'm sure three they years were, apart. Were they into music as well? Or they just... No, I tried to get my brother to play the drums so we could form a band. <laughs> like the Young Brothers? Yeah, that was the idea, but he just was more interested in surfing. <laughs> oh, so enough. for Christmas, I bought him a, a, a pair of drumsticks. And <laughs> he kind of he kind of had a go, but it just didn't work out. So, yeah, tell us about your trip to Japan then. Japan was awesome. Just finishing school and going to another country, I mean... Was, Especially an Asian country. Yeah, I was interested in martial arts at the time. Right. What type of martial arts? Uh, kind of like, kind of like jujitsu. It's right. called uh, Bujinkan Kobudo. Right. So um, I did that at King Cumber on the Central Coast for mm. a couple of years before I left. Yeah. But I didn't end up doing that one over there. I did like a little bit of judo, maybe kendo. Mm. I was in the wrestling club. Played right. Rugby. And then I was played in a band, so. The band pretty much consisted of Kiss and ACDC and Van Halen songs. <laughs> Nothing wrong. Really. Because the the bass player liked Gene Simmons out of the out of Kiss. Guitar the other guitarist play, who was a wizard liked uh, Eddie. Van Halen, and I liked ACDC. Right. And we used to play in these things called live houses, which were you basically pay to play, and then you try and make some money back off selling tickets to your school high school friends. Right. Yeah, that was awesome. That was good fun. It was a good year. Did you start writing any originals there, but or it was just purely just covers? No, that was all covers. Covers, right? Uh, in high school on the Central Coast, my teacher really encouraged me 
to, to write because I was writing at that stage more right you know political songs about the environment and all oh that stuff. very midnight oil sort of stuff yeah as yeah. fate would have it I ended up recording my first album which is my only album still right um, so let so, so, so let's so you went to Japan how long did you stay in Japan for 12 months 12 months you come back to come Australia back, I did an apprenticeship in carpentry right um, and did you have bands during that stage no so when did you first start sort of playing live again? I think my okay, one of my bosses, Mark Telfer, he had a band. He was a bass player and, and guitarist called Goods and Chattels. And then I, I was always playing. You know, I never, right. I never ever stopped playing or jamming. And I wasn't very good at discovering things online. So. Um, they had a band called Goods and Chattels and they played at markets and weddings and that kind of thing. Right. And I said, can I come along and play some acoustic guitar and sing like as a support act before, mm. before you show? The flat first one was down at Avoca Markets, I think it was. Right. Or something along the lines of that. And I played for half an hour and I loved it. And they said, do you want to play with the band? And I said, yeah. So I started, playing, I started playing with them. Um, so we played at Terrigal Markets once a month. We did bunch of weddings and right. birthday parties and that kind of stuff and that was good fun we played the blues a lot right. of Aussie stuff it's interesting like uh, being here in Shanghai now you can't obviously play a lot of Australian songs but back at home that's what people want to hear right yeah so, so what were you playing at that time play Hunters and Collectors yeah Chisel yeah all that kind of stuff we didn't do any ACDC or anything that heavy bit heavy we yeah do, we did the Eagles Oh yeah, Jackson Brown. Oh, all right. All that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Good memories, actually. Interesting. And how long did that go for? I reckon we. I was playing with them for five years or something. Five years, right? So that would have got you a bit of exposure to meeting some new people and. Yeah, so that was my early twenties, like yeah. twenty, two, twenty, twenty. Oh, probably not twenty one. Twenty two. Right. Twenty two to late twenties. And again, how far did that go before it sort of? That fizzled out because I moved away. Right. Um, so 2005, I go to Japan again. Right. So this is what I want to talk about then. Yeah, you go back to 2005. How did this all come about? It says 2005, World Expo in Japan. And you played a, at a jazz festival as well. Blues festival, yeah. Yeah, so tell us about that. Okay, so that was just a random me answering an ad in the paper. Right. So, 2003, Rugby World Cup. So, I was playing rugby for the Carry On Wanderers. On the Come Super on. Coast, Come on. And I was into rugby. Where did you play? What position? I started off at wing because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and then um, I ended up playing flanker. Right. Okay. Yeah. I loved it. Because Japan, like rugby's huge in Japan as well. Yeah. They've got their own team now. It's yeah, I saw him play. So, yeah, anyways, right. 2003, I decided to, I wanted to go to Sydney to watch the World Cup, but I thought I'd get in the festivities and just move there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, as you do. Yeah, so I got a job at the Sydney Harbour Marriott Hotel as a, as a bellboy. And I what think was that like? I, I only just finished my apprenticeship, I think. And so I move up there, or down there, and... Um, Oh man, it was awesome. The, the Japanese rugby team was staying at our hotel. Oh, right. And for little people, these guys were huge. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they, they, they were like seven foot tall. <laughs> yeah. No, they were good good, good folks. And um, so I went to a bunch of different games with my mates um, who actually played in Justin Beaton, who played for Terrigal. In, right. the, in the same comp, we were best mates, but we played against each other. Um, we went and Went and saw the uh, the grand final, and I went and saw Japan versus America and a bunch of games I, I don't recall. But yeah, so I moved to Sydney, and then to answer the other question, I was working at the hotel, and then I got approached to manage a Japanese restaurant. I thought this is pretty fun. This it's a whole yeah. lot easier than building, you know. Yeah. And you're not getting screamed at all day. I I end up I ended up working for about a year in this Japanese restaurant in Bondi Junction and um, I looked was just I was staying at my grandmother's and uh, I just 
bought the Sydney Morning Herald Saturday paper. Bought some crumpets, golden crumpets, and that was my morning. And Come on. I was reading through it. I saw a photo of Japan and saw the at the expo ad. Right. And that was that. I almost almost didn't get the job because why not? I didn't have a computer, right? And so I had to rush to get someone to help me to write up a resume. My home address was still mum's place on the central coast right and I think that yeah 23 or something like that it was this the, re, the reply for the I've been accepted for an interview sat on my bed for like two weeks right I'll get to it tomorrow <laughs> I'll get well, to I it wasn't even, I wasn't home oh right right I, wasn't, I wasn't there I was just crashing sort of I was at <clears> my <throat> grandmother's and girlfriend's and just sort of couch surfing at I almost didn't get it because I never replied. Wow. <laughs> anyway, that was awesome. And then, I, then I got flown to after the first one, got flown to Melbourne for the second interview, which I, the the boss later said I almost didn't get the job. Another guy. So it was you playing acoustic guitar, right? Yes, but I didn't start off doing that. I started right. off in the kitchen washing dishes. Right. So they for they for the Australian Pavilion. I think there was eighty of us or something that went over. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was working in a restaurant and spoke Japanese, I, I went over there. Did you? Yeah. Can you still speak it? A little bit yeah, of it? Yeah, I can. Uh, konnichiwa. Pro- pro- konnichiwa. Mm. We'll probably take... Arigato. A, a, arigato. <laughs> probably take a week of me being there for it to fully come back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't used it for a long time. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I got promoted to manager really quickly because my manager got fired for conflict of interest and uh, I said right we got to have music so met myself and another guy called Mark Dorrington formed a, a duo and they start and we started getting a cr- good crowds and right. um, and they started selling a lot of beer so how did you meet Mark Mark he was working as an attendant in the pavilion showing people around right and I think one night we were down at a local bar and we both had guitars um, and we just sort of gelled. He, yeah, he was yeah. he's a really good musician, like a great singer. He was experienced, always playing in Melbourne, lots of different bands, more, way more experienced than me. Right. And I learnt a lot from him too. Excellent. Yeah. So we played almost like, by the end of it, five nights a week for months. That's really cool. And tell us what, what the experience was like being in Japan again for the, the second time now being in Japan, right? Yeah. I was really enjoying it. Yeah? Yeah. Were the Japanese people, the fans, enjoying that sort of style of music? Yeah, the good thing about the Japanese crowd is they really appreciate music. Yes. They, I mean, they really appreciate music. So they like to have a few bevies and sit and enjoy the show. Yes. Um, Don't you think that's the same with Shanghai and China in general? No. No, definitely not. Different. Oh. They go into a, a whole new level of deepness into the music. They'll, st- um, although maybe I've answered that incorrectly because I don't speak Chinese because I didn't think I'd be here this long. Maybe because I don't communicate right. a lot with the local people s- so much. It's very different here. It's different because they have like restrictions on what sort of music they can listen to, and you know. Anyway. I th- yeah, I think because. <coughs> It was so closed for so long. They just did the local people here just don't have the, um, the experience in yeah. listening to to Western music. Very I think hearts cool. are definitely valued here. Yes, yes. I mean, that's why there's so many kids that push so hard from such a young age to, yes. to master an instrument. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I wish I did that. Yeah, <laughs> but I also tell that you need to be very rich to uh, play an instrument here and have lessons as a piano yeah as well so that that doesn't help but yeah japan tell, tell us tell us like you know the fans and, and you're playing how long did you stay there for i stayed there for i think it was 11 months right did you want to stay there or would you have yeah. all the intentions of coming back to australia oh look i always miss australia um, yeah for sure but i was having such a good time and i was earning a regular wage mm. Um, so I bought a couple of cool new guitars. Goods and Chattels came over. Right. The band, we bought, that, bought them over. And I met a bunch of different Australian artists that I hadn't seen before or had heard of and got to meet them and see them play at the pavilion. Like, I think Kate Sobrano came over. Yeah, and, right. An artist from 
from Melbourne by the name of Jeff Lang, who I became a huge fan of and respected his songwriting and singing and guitar playing. And this, I think he's one of Australia's best artists. Um, so I became a huge fan of him. And uh, I guess it changed my musical journey completely. Why is that? Well, before that, I was completely into electric guitar. I mean, I liked my rock and everything. Mm. And I, I loved the Eagles as well. And so I was playing acoustic guitar for that. But then he just... A whole new spectrum of different tunings and sly guitar and a completely different style. And I was like, what the hell is this? And he was a really nice guy too. So... Uh, so you, at, at that stage, you were just like playing on a standard E-tuning? like this, Just standard E-tuning. Mm. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he brought in like a capo? Oh, or you, you... A whole new quiver full of different tunings and capo positioning. Right. And slide guitar. And I just thought it was really cool. I mean, previously, I, I was a bit into slide, but I had no I had no idea, really. So, um, so was it difficult for you to play, pick up that sort of style of playing? I mean, it's not... You just put it on your finger and away you go you're there's a whole sort of technique to I it I had time okay so what <laughs> happened was I came back from the expo I think I dithered around surfing I just went surfing every day <laughs> when I got back to McMaster's beach because I just missed that's it that's a beautiful beach by the way just quite yeah. like, get down there if and you play guitar I got into jazz because one of the other artists was George Washing Machine and Jim Pennell. George Washing Machine? Well, it's not his real name. Oh. It took me years to work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just round and round and round <laughs> like a washing machine. Yeah. So anyway, he's a funny guy. And so I started getting jazz lessons and just was surfing. and was. I wasn't really... There's not much to spend money on at McMaster's Beach. So I, did, I, yeah. I kind of didn't sort of blow through it real quickly. Well, the, th the thing is that, like, with, you're talking about jazz. I mean, jazz is, like, you can keep learning about jazz all the time. There's so many different ways you can play uh, chord progressions. It's one of the hardest, I th personally think, one of the hardest sort of styles to play on guitar. Do you agree? No? Uh, yeah, I think it's just spending time on anything. Mm. Well, I haven't mastered jazz, so I can't fully answer yeah. the question. Yeah. I haven't really mastered anything yet. Dungog. Mm. Out past Maitland. What were you doing out there? Building a house. So oh. I eventually got back on the tools. Yeah, got back on the tools and started working for my old boss that I did my apprenticeship with. Right. So we're building a house out of Dungog and we're living on a caravan out there. Yeah, that's right. And then what happened was I have Crohn's disease, so I got really sick. I had four bowel obstructions. Oh my God. So I, I end up working for, for Phil Marler, um, very good builder, and um, building a house out there. And then I end up getting sick. I was just about to, this completely different change in direction. I was about to buy a brand new Toyota Hiace and then get all the tools and everything and deck that out to be a carpenter. Mm. And um, I got sick and ended up in hospital. So after the first expo, I knew I wanted to be a musician. I loved it, and I saw professional musicians coming through, but I wasn't sure how to how to how to do it. So I go back on the tools, get sick, and I couldn't work. I had ended up having thirty centimeters of my bowel removed. Um, my God! So I couldn't work for two years. <clears throat> it was a really hard time. But so anyway, but during that time, during that time, I. Uh, I really experimented and played a lot of guitar. Mm. So during that two years, I picked up the slide, um, really experimented with the different tunings, uh, and and did a lot, a lot of songwriting. Right. And because I wasn't working, and I had no social life, I had a lot of time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So... Um, experimenting I, and just... I did a lot of... A lot of playing, yeah. Right. So, what period are we up to now? This is like that. I think we've now moved. That I ended up ended up having my operation in two thousand and eight. Right. But I was sick for a lot of time before that. Okay. But you you were playing music still, and then I have here two thousand and ten. You represented Australian music at the Shanghai World Expo. Yeah. How so, did this all come about? This is an amazing achievement. So what happened was, I had lot, done a lot in that 
five years, including being sick. Um, 2005 World Expo, that was just luck. I got the job. <coughs> yeah. And and then we ended up playing music and it went well. And we were reliable. Mm. Yeah. So. I was used to normally reliable. <laughs> Except for when we pissed. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we can handle it, dude. We're, we're, we're up there. We're, 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 we have we're like the, to have fun. We're with the Germans and the Irish and Australia's up there. I to- totally like, agree. We like our beer. We do. We love our beer. Yes. In fact, you're almost empty. Do you want to know That's one? it. <laughs> <laughs> I met up with my old boss and good friend Simon Arnold. Um, and we came up with a plan to put in a tender to the Australian government. And because we worked with them before and they, they knew what I did... Hmm. Um, they eventually approved it. Who recommended you for this one? An awesome bloke by the name of Peter Sams. It was really Simon Arnold for he, that different company, but Peter Sams from from, from DFA. Because I I played music at the Pavilion before, five years previous. Um, he recommended me because I did. I think I did a good job. Well, not a fan. Maybe I wasn't the best musician in or going around, but I worked hard and always turned up. So you went to Shanghai. Now you must have ha- already had original songs. Oh yes. This, so right? 2009, I record my album "Money Breeze Flies." Right. So let's talk about this. How did that all come about? Who produced it? Uh, where did you produce it? Tell us all about it. Yep, so how did it come about? I did most of the writing for that song when I was sick. Right. And I couldn't work. Um, and then I got approached on MySpace. Remember MySpace? Yeah. I got that was happening. That was yeah, hot at the time. That was hot at the time. People were putting their MySpace addresses on their albums. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, was, I got approached by a producer on MySpace and he... Borrowed the money for the album, got ripped off, oh. suicidal, you know. Oh. It was a pretty dark time. Anyway, my good friends, Luke and Gus Bonnet, came to the rescue and um, they produced the next album for me. And a lot of the, the lyric content and songs were written about that as well. Right. But, you know, looking back, I think I got some of my best, best songwriting out of that period. That time. That time. So, what the title? Money breeds flies. Where did that come from? Okay. So, well, they say that in the Bible, money is the root of all evil, evil right? Mm. So, and what a fl- what a flies normally hang around? Shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So, so I've got a picture of a fly mm. si- sitting on a wad of cash. Right. So, being ripped off all that money um. by a con man, um, that's how that... The album title came about. Gotcha. And on gotcha. the back of the album, which you don't see on the um, on the online services like iTunes, the fly is upside down, dead. Oh. Ah. Yeah. So tell us, you know, how long did it take you to record? Did you just go in there and bam it out live, and then go out and play some some shows? Or I think we recorded it in three weeks. Right. Three weeks straight. Mix mastered. Oh no! It might have, I think it was three weeks of actual recording. Right. I could be slightly wrong, but somewhere around there, it was done really quickly. Right. Um, but we did it full time, eight hours a day, every day. Right. Um, and we, rec- I so recorded with Luke, Luke and Gus Bonnick on the uh, on the Green Point Emerald Point Studios. The bulk of it was done there. The beds, like the drums and the the bass, and some of the guitar work was recorded at um, Oceanic Studios. Who was the guitar player for Midnight Oil? He had his own. Oh. Really amazing. We did a few days record. Maybe a, maybe a week of the recording was done there. Yeah. Right. And that was really cool because you got all this old vintage gear and, wow. um, and I'm kind of rebounding after the last few years of of pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mental and physical. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you know that that gives you sort of motivation to do better and do good. So that was it, the best it, thing I ever did. Yeah, you know. So I go to we we eventually got approved for a four piece band, house band at the Pavilion. Right. Um, and I had something to bring with me, you know. Mm. And 
and some experience. I mean, those guys pushed me too, so I learned a lot from them as well. Right. And recording and perf- not performing on a stage so much, but singing and all that kind of thing. Right. And so we went over to, uh, to Shanghai. You know, previously to Shanghai Expo, I had, what was that for? What? I well, had no idea, no, no yeah. aspirations to go to China at all. I'd yeah. never even crossed my mind. Yeah. So what were your first impressions of China? Awesome. It was crazy. Yeah. It was just like back then, 10 years ago, even before I got here, it was even crazier. It was like the Wild West. Right. I remember the, the, even just the scooter scene, right? You got, I remember going for, uh, going guitar shopping on Jingling Tong Lu, because we had to get all the back line, the different amps and drum sets, right. and drum kit, and bass amp, and all that stuff. And I was just mesmerized how the scooters and bicycles can interweave. Yeah. Now everything's really regulated, and the camera's everywhere, and yeah. people obey the rules, and Back then, there weren't any rules. Right. And I was just like, whoa, how did they not have an accident? Uh, so I pulled up a chair, a six-pack, and just sat there afternoon just getting... Watching, just, just watching the traffic. <laughs> 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 it was so fun. I was just like, this is just completely a different universe. It still happens in Thailand and Vietnam now. Oh, I haven't been there for a couple of years. Let's go there. Yeah. A couple of chairs and an esky. China. <laughs> And seriously, a dollar, a dollar a beer, yeah, on on a little plastic chair, and just like, yeah, just watch, watch, you know, the days go by. It's just, ah, it's a different universe. It is. And then the music scene here was phenomenal. Mm. So it was like a melting pot of really amazing musicians from all around the world. You had the Cotton Club, you had Jay Z Club, the House of Blues and Jazz, plus the Expo. <coughs> right. So you had all different artists. Like the different coming residency in. house bands and the touring bands right. as well that were coming through at that time. So it was just amazing. It was, and I, was, I remember walking into the Cotton Club for the first time, seeing this American blues band, jazz blues band. It wasn't purely just blues. And I was just blown away. I was like, whoa. You know how they had that moment with ACDC all those years before that? This was the same again, right. in a different style. Right. And I ended up playing there on and off for six years before it closed. Right. So, when you went there for the first time in 2010, did you actually stay there for like a... I stayed, my contract was for six months. Right. And because (coughs) we were performing for the six months of the expo, that was myself, Lee Hardesty on saxophone and piano, um, Max Hay on bass, and he also played guitar and sang, Leon Tussie on drums. Right. So we had a pretty cool band. Yeah. We had a really good band, actually. So you were yeah. playing all the music from your album? From my album, plus Max's songs. How did the... How did the plus, sing- plus all the... We had to play a lot of Australian songs. Right. And then a few American covers that the, the crowd would know, right. like Hotel California. Of course. Um, yeah. Country Roads. So how were the, the Chinese people at that time sort of reacting to your... It was different to Japan. It was like they weren't tamed, like the because J- Japanese culture is pretty mm. structured, right? Here they were, I think they were like, "What is this?" They loved it. Yeah. I think the first day there was like three thousand people there or something like that. Rah. Rah. Yeah, it was cool. It was just different again. It was a, it was like as I said, the Wild West, and it just had this raw energy. Mm. There's just energy in the air. Right. And then, plus you had like 160 different countries participating in wow. this expo. It was pretty much like one big party. So you were here for almost a year. Did you go back to Australia then? Or did you... Yeah, so we did six months of the music. Mm-hmm. And then because of my trade background, I, I, I stuck around for another seven months helping, helping pull everything down and ship it back to Melbourne. Right. So then I went back to Melbourne after that. Mm, why Melbourne? Because that's where the warehouse was for everything ah. to ship back from the um, expo. Right. Australian Pavilion. Right, so you were there for... I was in Melbourne for maybe six months. Well, it mm. might be let four or five, I don't remember. Something like that. Right. So I stayed for another... So about 14 months in total for the first time to China. And then five or six months or some, something like that down in, in Melbourne. So where does this 
end up where you end up coming back to China? I wanted to come back to the Cotton Club. Right. So I ended up um, coming back at the end of 2011. And I just sort of I got a job playing there. I think I started off one night. One. Oh, when I came back, it was t- t- twice a week. And then I started picking up different gigs around town and sort of went from there. Right. And then I, I, I kind of did like a year on, six months off. Yeah, Cotton Club. I come back to Shanghai, end up playing a couple of nights a week. And um, I was loving life. So I was playing with all these amazing different musicians. Had a bunch of different gigs with at, at other places. Yeah. And I was learning a lot, so... Like, what were you learning? Different styles of music. Oh. I was learning to play with a lot of different musicians, and the party scene was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't go out clubbing or anything like that. I never did anything like that. I had no interest in that, but I just enjoyed the music, and had a few cold beers at the same time. Mm. So that was pretty much it. But I just was. And then, I, uh, then through as the, long as the beers are cold, right? Yeah. Oh, the Chinese like to drink warm beer, you know. Oh. Uh, I don't know how they do it. It's disgusting, isn't it? Totally. In the winter, they they say, oh, you know, you know, the colder the the weather, the warmer the beer. It's like no. <laughs> each their each to their own, you know. Just don't give one of those to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, I was and then through the day. I'd be a lot of I'd do writing and practicing, and I was get I, actually then I really got into cold chisel. Right. Oddly enough, and I was really appreciating Jimmy Barnes as a singer. Yes. Um, oh, skip back a few years. I was a massive Ian Moss fan. Mossy, yeah. So I'd go to a long, along to a lot of his gigs, and one night, right, I end up playing Texas Holden poker, if I remember correctly, at the basement with a cricketer, what? Mike Whitney. Mike Whitney, yeah. Yeah, with him. Steve Some other guys I don't know who, myself, and then Phil Small, from the bass player from Cold Chisel. Or he might have just been watching. He mightn't have been in the game. I don't know. But anyway, and I just got this signed copy of um, Mossy's new album. But previous to that, for the last couple of years, I've been following Mossy around all, all around Sydney, even driving right. from the Central Coast. So you got to, to know Rudy him? Rudy Hill RSL and all those different places, or some Rudy Hill Workers Club or whatever it was. All over the place. New town. Mm. Central Coast. Okay, so here's the that. story. So here's the story. I end up getting shit face drunk, going up to Jimmy Barnes and telling him I sang K San every night at the 2005 Bill Expo, which is quite embarrassing. <laughs> um, it's amazing. I remember it. Hopefully he doesn't, in case I ever meet him again. And he was really polite, actually. He was really nice. And so I, I get drunk, and then Phil Small goes, Don't leave the CD on the. which I just purchased and left on the counter because someone will nick it. And I'm yes. a pretty honest guy, so I'm like, I'm like oh, that one's going to steal it. You know? <laughs> anyway, someone did. Oh. I was like, why would they steal that? It's it signed, Cheers Dave, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been another Dave. Yeah. The police go, any idea who, 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 who might have stolen it? Yeah, yeah, his name is Dave. It must <laughs> be got Dave. Dave written on it. No so idea. anyway, so, um, and then, so Phil goes, okay, let's go ask Ian for another copy of the CD. So wow. he he gave me one. Wow, that's and great. And re-signed it. Well, signed it for me again. The legend. Yeah, that was that night. And uh, see, so I was a huge Mossy fan. Yeah. So come back to Shanghai, I was just listening to Chisel a lot, like The Last Stand, mm. uh, DVD, and different albums. Yeah. Yeah. So never, yes. never been, never been to see them live. Unfortunately, oh. when they were in Sydney, they did the Ringside tour. Were they? Uh, did, acoustic and, show or something. No, yeah, kind of. They had that rotating stage. Yeah, yeah. That was when I was working in Sydney, but I didn't have the money. Right. So I never got to see them. Hmm, interesting. They'll still be going. But once the pandemic so. hits, Barnes will get them going. Unfortunately, I, I missed um, Steve Preswich. He passed oh. away, the drummer. Right. So, yeah, but I'd like to see them one day. And I ended up doing the song, Jimmy Barnes' song, The Rising Sun. Mm. At the Cotton Club with the Cotton Club band. And Tony Story, went, who was one of the partners, business partners, guy from Geelong, Melbourne, he went to school with Jimmy Barnes' wife. 
It's such a small world. Yeah. Really so is. I'd, I'd like to um, shake his hand one day. Yeah. What a legend, Barnsley. He's like a cult, cult figure in what Australia. A voice. Yeah. Still doing it. Of course. I've read hey. both his books. Hmm. My mum got them for me for uh, Christmas. Actually, did you see the the bio of his video, where he was like, no, nope. talking about his life? You should watch it. It's it's amazing. So, tell me, you know, you, you've been in Shang, you're in Shanghai now. You're playing at the Cotton Club. You, you're getting gigs. Uh, how does this all interact with the Pearl and Grant O. Bucklaw? Oh, okay, so um. Cut fast forward to 2016. Right. I pack up to go back to Sydney. Right. Why? Okay, my brother. You had got, enough. Yeah, my brother. My brother got married, um, and then, well, she's from Sydney too. But they went to Italy, and for a holiday for a month because she's like part Italian or something. So they went to Italy for. A honeymoon, and then they were planning on going to France and around Europe, and they were going to visit some of her grandmother's relatives or something like that. Right. And um, then there was that that truck incident in France where the guy ran over all the tourists with it in the truck. Remember that? Yes. So they ended up staying in Italy all the time, and God bless those people's souls. Wow. So at that time, I was going to renovate my brother's house with my dad, which I thought was a really good opportunity. To spend some quality time with my father, which I hadn't done for a long time Mm. I enroll in a business course I start working on the on the new album um it's all getting ready to go and then uh my wife came to came to Sydney for a holiday right and I came back here (laughs) just like that yeah we were purely just friends before and I thought I'll pick her up at the airport and take her around and you know, do the the tourist guide thing, and because she's nice and everything, and and then um, yeah, wind up putting everything else on hold. So you go back to Shanghai six months after because I had to save up the money. Right. And then um, yeah, back to Shanghai, and was this for the expo again that you went when you went? No, back this is 2016. So this is six years after the expo. No, 2017. Sorry. Yeah. So how did you meet? Grant then? So, oh, good question. Um, so Grant, Grant I knew from 2010. Right. Because he often put shows on at the Australian Pavilion for uh, the, the parties. Uh, oh. the, for the staff parties for all the... I think it was once every couple of months we'd have a party at the Pavilion. I might have been even... Something like that. It might have been two or three times. And there was a club called Chinatown here where they had all the burlesque dancers and the sort of Vegas style of level of yes shows going on and um, and he was he was part of that and I got to meet him then he was he's, he used to be a really cool photographer as you know yes well you've interviewed him and then he used to come into the Cotton Club every now and then take photos to, well no he's just partying right <laughs> <laughs> Just out for a good time with his friends, yeah. And uh, it's like, hey, Green, how's it going? And then fast forward a number of years, um, I came back to Shanghai. The Cotton Club had closed. Oh. Unfortunately, the building got repossessed. Still nothing there, uh, and which is shite. Yeah, it got repossessed by the government, and they've just done fuck all with it. And we're just going. That was four years ago. All the amazing music and culture the city could have had. Yeah. So it's a huge loss. So I didn't have anywhere to play, and I needed a work visa. And so friends of mine, uh, the guy who does my website, Andy Thomas, um, I spoke to Grant, and Grant liked me as a musician and thought I could sort of contribute to to the Pearl. Yeah, I've been there for two years now. Right. So. I can remember the first time that I went to the Pearl, I think it was about two years ago, and I walked in, it was ACDC tribute show, and I was like, yeah, hell yeah. So the bass player that I was in at the time was like, let's go to this ACDC show. Didn't know what to expect, but, you know, 
and then uh, you walk out, and the ACDC, the the the, uh, the Angus schoolboy, schoolboy suit from Berwick, and they Asheville have boys high. They have a Brian Johnson. They have a Bon, bon Scott. Scott, and then they have this girl singing. And I was like, what? She's not going to be able to sing Bon Scott songs. Nailed it. So that's Xenia. Really so how did this all come about? Like, what were your first sort of gigs there at the Pearl when you first started? I think that might have been my first show. So I don't remember. I might have started off playing my solo original stuff right? before I got integrated into that. I had this plan before I even worked at the Pearl, I thought, because they had, diff- had different theme shows in the past. There's um, Raina Scar, who used to sing at the Cotton Club, did a, a Queen show there because she was a huge Queen fan. Right. Now the problem with the Pearl is it's it's kind of out of the way for people who live in the city to get to. So yeah. you've got to have something really cool going on yes. to want to go all the way out there and spend the taxi money. So anyway, so I thought about I always wanted to put a really cool ACDC tribute band together. They were already doing this Monsters of Rock show. So I think I brought that up to Grant. I said I'll go and get it. I'll go and get the schoolboy suits made up. I think it might have cost me three hundred dollars for two suits or something. Yeah. I got a red one and a blue one. I and mean, this is Angus Young, right? Yeah. All that, having said that, I'm, I'm actually more of a Malcolm Young fan. His brother, of the course. rhythm guitar player. Yeah, fantastic rhythm guitar player. It's sort of I started there, yeah, from from that night. And away you go. So how did you go about? Finding these other like Bon Scott and Bon Scott singer and the Brian because they, they were already doing the that was the hard part. Right. They were they were doing the Monsters of Rock show already. Right. A broad spectrum of different stuff from. So for you, 80s. so for you, how how the long band it, was already there for me. So how long did it take for you to learn all the all the like Angus parts like like the solos? I still haven't. <laughs> <laughs> No, I work. I've been. I'm working on it all the time. Yeah, that guy's a really good player. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm always, always practicing it, always yeah. learning it. Every, not every day, because there's so many different songs to do. But I don't remember. It might have been a couple of months I prepared for that show. Every day, just ACDC. Yeah. But I was loving it, man. Yeah. I thought this is so cool. I got my new suit. I got the got the got the SG, and I've got I got a new <laughs> set of speakers. And I was just playing along the ACDC for two months. You know what the best thing about my wife is? She loves ACDC. Come on. <laughs> that's a winner. That's, yeah. that's a winner. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh-huh. no, there's better things, but... Yeah, that's, yeah, better that's, things. A, that's, that's a bonus, anyway. You've got to be politically correct <laughs> these days. <laughs> it's a bonus. So, yeah, you, you do the ACDC show, but it's not only just ACDC shows, so... I've been to quite a few shows since I come back and like I said before I interviewed Grant and he um, you know I go to as many shows as I can now I'm a bit picky now because you know I've seen certain shows a bit but you but you play predominantly your set at the start of the show right yeah um, well it depends on the show and then there's Mark as well he does that Mark Wingalewski Mm -hmm. from Chicago we sort of swap it around depending on the show who's available he's got different gigs elsewhere or whatever so you you're also a part of the Adele and Ed Sheeran yes being a genuine ranger (laughs) redhead (laughs) I'm probably the only guy in town in the city of 30 million (laughs) that plays guitar and sings and has red hair yeah wow Oh, Are you look, a fan I, I, of Ed Sheeran? Look, no, I'm not. Mm. But I respect him as a musician, totally. Yeah. Uh, as a songwriter, as a musician, and as well, singer and guitarist. Because mm. um, there's uh, there's other things you do, like grunge. Oh yeah, the unplugged show. So oh, like you do all the yeah the grunge or the or the uh, those albums came out or the lead vocalists that have passed away. Yeah, Nirvana, Audio Slate. Well, sorry, Soundgarden. Mm. Um, Stone Temple Pilots and yeah, so I I'll just play rhythm guitar and that right. And ha- was it easy to sort of come into to play with the Red Stars? I mean, you know. it wasn't at first. At that particular time when I first started at the Pearl, I was drinking pretty heavy, <laughs> right? And I really had to um, sort myself out. Mm. So 
um, because they don't drink at all. Right. Well, not before a show. Professionals. Anyway. They're very professional. Mm. And um, very different background to the Cotton Club, where the band's drinking before the show, the customers are bringing you drinks. Um, it's just encouraged. It's yeah. really encouraged because the customers actually want it because you know, everyone's having a really good yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I kind of came in with that, that attitude, she'll be right, mate, kind of attitude. Yeah. And the Pearl's a different beast because it's it has, it's, a, it's a ticketed show. You're paying, what, yeah. 30, 40 bucks to get in. Yeah. And and everything, it's a themed show. It's not just a blues night. So I had to sort myself out quick, which I did. So I play here. We do the Unplugged night, the Ed Sheeran night. Now Pink Floyd was... A, mm. That was huge. Yeah, I've, been heard, I've heard nothing but good things from... The Pink Floyd show. I will oh, definitely I be there for the next, next one. one. Mm. Because that's what I played in Goods and Chattels. The the the, the band on the Central Coast. Right. I kind of got into Pink Floyd, or at least heard about it then. And then when I was in Japan in 2005 for the World Expo, I listened to Pink Floyd a lot. So you're doing Pink Floyd now. Is there anything at the Pearl that you haven't done that you want to sort of look into? Yeah. I don't think it would sell that well here, but the Eagles. Right. I'd like to do an Eagles night, but I've got to convince Grant that yeah, it's, he'll, it's he'll pay the rent. Worthy. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. the Eagles. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not a band I really listen to a lot now, but in my early 20s I did, and I just thought, oh, that'd be a cool, fun show to do. I love Joe Walsh. used to love the James Gang. What about Australian night? Australian music? We tried that, but no one goes. Really? Yeah. Um, I used to be pretty heavily involved with the Aussie community here. Not so much anymore. I've kind of been wanting to go back there, but just been busy with life. Yeah. Yeah, right. A lot of people have left. Mm. A lot of people left pre-COVID or are going home. It's just getting harder to live here. So now, it's 2021. It's a cliche question, but, you know, you said that you've recorded half of the album. So, plans for the future? Yeah, so I'm going to wait till price... So the prices go down for plane tickets. Mm. Um, I went onto Corner's website the other day and I couldn't get any, couldn't even find any. It's oh. about ten thousand bucks to go home. Wow! Now. Yeah. It's very and then you got to pay three grand at a hotel quarantine on top of that. Mm. So I'd rather just be patient and yeah. There's heaps of work here. So tell us why don't you want to finish recording the album here in Shanghai? Because my mum's in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I trust, good, good. I, I trust, I trust, hi mum, no, mm -hmm. I, I trust the guys I work with and I like them a lot. Right. Because there's just no bullshit, they're not doing it for the money. Yeah, I and, and totally. I mean, obviously you pay them, but I mean like, they're, they're, they're not like sharks. Yes. They've got good morals and ethics. Yes. Um, and they're passionate about the music. They're all about the song. Getting the best. Getting the best and their heart's in it. Yeah. You can't get, that's hard to find. Yes. And I was just blessed enough to run into those guys pretty early. I, well, actually, I went to... We've known each other since we were 14. So you kind of got that long, long-term long relationship. So you've recorded... Like, you have recorded half of the album, but do you have, like, all this new material now? Or, or where are you up to? I have new songs, yes, and I've yeah. been working on the parts since I've been here. Right. Um, but I'm hoping to write better ones. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so as soon as you go back to Australia, that's what you're going to do? Go to yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping to have everything financially in place. Mm -hmm. So I can just go back, got the money, I, I can just lock in the time and just and go back prepared, rehearsed, and go into the studio, know all the, know all the lyrics, and then um, and just lay it down really quickly. And you're happy to stay in Look, I, I, Australia this time? Or you, the... The itch will come back to, to come back to Shanghai. No, um, I will have to come back because my wife's here and she has a businesses here. Right. But I want to go. I haven't told her yet, but I want to go home for six months. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to do some gigging around. Um, well, hopefully at that time things will have gone back to normal. Yeah. I'd like to do some gigging around Sydney and Melbourne and up and down the East Coast. Newey, come on. Yeah, that's up and down the East. That's pretty close. Yeah. Wow. Wherever, wherever will have me play. 
Exactly. Wherever I can get paid a hundred bucks or more. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Can you delete that? <laughs> <laughs> Five hundred or more. Five hundred. A thousand. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand. It depends how many people I can pull pull into the club. A thousand, plus a, a percentage of the bar. All right. Yeah. I can be your manager. I can well, you. Sure. <laughs> Tell us, uh, is there, are there any sort of stories or anything that sort of sticks out uh, with you living in Shanghai? Good times, Ooh. bad times? Good, best time? Cotton club years. Yeah. I met so many cool people, got to play heaps of cool music with different musicians from all over the world. Right. Definitely the cotton club years. It was a home. Right. It was a home. It was a, it, that was my, my apartment wasn't my home. The cotton club was the home. You walk in there and every time every you, you know everyone or you could see someone every three or six months later that we're here on a business <coughs> trip and you'd remember their name and, and it was good to see them again and they were happy to see you and we played some really cool music had some good nights and lifelong friends yeah absolutely so let's promote your your album uh, where can we go online and tell us about your social medias Okay, so my name is Dave Stone. The album is Money Breeds Flies. Mm -hmm. And you can get it, if you want it in its physical copy, it's distributed through Green Media, which is an offshoot of MGM Australia. So you can get it like, like JB Hi-Fi or any... Yeah, right. Any good any good uh, CD shop if they still exist. No, I, I want to do it one day. It's just the money. Right. Um, yes, I love vinyl. Or you can get it online, on iTunes, Spotify. Or you can go to my website, uh, Dave DaveStone dot com. So it's yes. Dave hyphen or dash Stone dot com. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And then, do you have any personal ones that they can check you out online, like Facebook or? Instagram? I'm on Facebook, but I never use it. I was thinking of deleting it. Right. Uh, YouTube. YouTube? YouTube, YouTube's the go. Okay. Um, my album's also on YouTube. Dave Stone, Money Breeds Flies. I think you can even. I shouldn't promote this. You should. You can even listen to it for free on there. Right. Yeah, YouTube, Dave Stone Band. I think it's called. No. Right. But anyway, all the links are from my website. And do you have uh, any upcoming gigs? Yeah. Shows. It's sure. It's sure. Right. And then we've got Pink Floyd coming up, and I'll be playing here at the restaurant. At the pool and no, ho the hopefully, and hopefully, I can get to the UK and the US and Canada. Come on, and Japan after COVID and really rip around the world. So after the after all the podcasts, I ask some like simple general questions, and I want you to tell me your top three or four, you know, favorite of today. Are you ready, Dave? I think so. Shoot. Okay. So first one is. Can you tell me your top three or four favourite bands? ACDC? Yes. Cold Chisel? Jeff Lang. Oh, can I add a fourth? Yeah. Tedeschi, Chuck, Tedeschi Trucks Band and okay. the Allman Brothers Band. Okay. A mixture of those. Now, vocalists. Jimmy yeah. Barnes, Bon Scott, um, Bobby, Bobby Blue Band. Bobby Blue Band? Not Ian Thorpe, the singer. Billy Thorpe. Billy Thorpe. <laughs> And <laughs> Thorpe the singer, the no. swimmer. Three or four favorite albums of today. Today or as of today, or if know, I could choose time. my top three album, Let There Be Rock, ACDC, mm. East, Cold Chisel, Cedar Grove, Jeff Lang. Mm. Interesting. Okay, your top three or four favorite sporting teams: Parramatta Eels, Rugby League. Come on. And last question: uh, Who is your who is your biggest inspiration slash hero? Malcolm Young would be my hero. Mm. Just a really good work ethic. Yeah. And a good musician. He was the one running ACDC. And seemed like he had his shit together. Yeah. Had the vision, but he yeah, worked hard and he seemed like a... He from was, what I can gather, he's a nice guy. He was writing the music, he was booking the shows... He was running that whole band. Angus was like the, they, and even Angus says that he's a better. That Malcolm was a better guitarist than well, Angus. Yeah, he was. He just didn't want to show off. Didn't and want he to. was humble. Yeah, I, I don't like. 
I don't like um, people that aren't humble. Yeah. Well, I don't want to listen to them too much. I might respect them as for how their abilities, but it stops there. Second hero, Jesus. Uh, three. Are you a religious man? Yeah, I am. I don't pray. As, I often forget to pray, but yeah. <laughs> How's it going, boy? I guess Jeff Lang is a singer, songwriter, guitarist, which is what I kind of am. Mm. Um, just traveling, just to do to be a full time musician is really hard work. It is for low pay. People don't realize how tough it is. It's very you've really tough. got to want to do what you want. To That's do right. It. You've got to have a passion or a love. And I feel like I haven't even started yet. That's good. And I've been doing it pretty much full time for ten years. Wow. I'm still earning shit money. The future's only young, and then. You know, the new album, when you get back to Australia, maybe next year, come on. Come back on the show and promote it. Yeah. Thank you very much. But we have a very special part of the, the podcast, and I've never done this before. So the idea was, because we're huge, uh, oh, ACDC was... The first band that I ever watched live, my dad took me when I was 15 years old for the Ball Breaker Tour. Um, it was an amazing show, and um, uh, my ears are still ringing from that concert, but, uh, you know, it's such an inspiration. Um, and for Dave, especially, growing up in Australia. So I remember as a kid coming up, but before that, for me, going from the Central Coast coming into Sydney and seeing all the factories go from uh, you know the National Park along the mm. F3 or M1 now coming into there and for me that was sort of ACDC territory definitely and the, I agree I bought my I bought Malcolm Young's sig signature guitar mm, I was told the, that the I got, Gretsch I got the Gretsch Malcolm <coughs> Young signature duo jet and I was told I got the very first one in Australia I had to wait three months for it to be made Wow. Ordered. But I can't prove that was the case, but that was in 2003 for any guitar. Freaks, I think it was 2003. Wow. 3,800 I paid for it then. Wow. But the new ones, which are made by the custom shop, because I've been looking and I've been thinking about another one, right? But which is exactly identical. They're like $10,000 US. It doesn't have like a pickup in the Gretsch, right? Like, like no, yeah, it's just got the the, um, the front pickup. It hasn't got the right. the, neck or the, the middle there. Makes it really clean, out. like a clean sound. Like a still got a bit of kick to it, but it's, it's kind of hollow. But yeah, I don't. Know if we get too technical. technical. Now, but they say they say that the one pickup, all the the strings go to that that one pickup's magnet, right. as opposed to being over three. But that's just the sound he wanted. But I've, I'd like to get one one day because, yeah, Malcolm Young is my guitar hero. Yeah. Humble and it's all about the feel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the groove and the feel. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that ACDC, I think I've seen them ever since that. that it's funny how Dad took me to my first ACDC show. And then after that, when they came back maybe five years later... I took him to that show, and then I took him to the next show as well. So it's just funny how... Um, and maybe, in the future, if they're still going, I can take my unborn son to ACDC and your unborn... Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can take him to an ACDC oh show. Oh, God, we've got to hurry up. <laughs> we've got to hurry up. <laughs> and they just wrote a new album. Come on, it sounds great. Yeah, like, but I know... I know. <laughs> I don't know, Angus. How old is that? We've got to hurry up anyway. How old is Angus? 65 or something? Yeah. I don't know. He's counting. He's still, uh, his, he's still pretty young. He still wears a school suit all the time, huh? As long as Angus is, is uh, you know, oh, yeah, but you kicking get a, and rocking. Keep the whole band together. Well, they've got Phil Rudd back. Got they, Phil they've Rudd got back. Uh, Cliff, Cliff Williams back. Uh, Brian Johnson's back okay. in the band. So that, and that's... Stevie Young's filling in. Oh, that, that's as original as you can get, so... That's great having Phil right in the band. I mean, permanently? Yeah. yeah. He's had a few things. But, yeah, we're both very, very big, big, big fans. very, very big ACDC fans, obviously being from Australia and uh, being able to... You've seen him play? Yeah, I saw him two nights in a row. I think it was a stiff upper lip tour. In Sydney? Well, I always thought it was the Ball Breaker album. 
but I was too young. So um, that was ninety six, right? Ball Breakout came out. Ninety six, yeah. So no, it would have been the stiff upper lip tour. I, I I was yeah. I was. Here's you know what I did. I was doing carpentry on the Central Coast, a place called Niagara Park. I was a second year apprentice, and normally I'd be a a good employee and pack every, all the t- bosses' tools up and the other carpenters. I just I just got out of there. It's like I'm going ACDC, motherfucker. <laughs> um, and I just left all the tools on the all over the lawn. I just drove off. <laughs> it was anyway. It was, it was so, so it was worth it. Totally it worth it. But you know the the, the so next night loud. after that. The next night after that, my boss went to the concert. He goes, man, I couldn't hear for a week. Yeah, that's it. I went to school. And, and I said, you know what? You, I'm glad you couldn't hear me for a week because you know what I called you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. He was a good guy. I'm being silly. I remember going to school that next day and I couldn't hear anything. It was like it was like a thousand crickets like in my ear. And I was yeah. like, yeah, it was a good show. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Angus was jumping around and he was jumping on the stage and doing the, you know, the, the, doing the, the duck walk. The duck just... walk, yeah. But uh, we are going to do our set list. So I, I gave Dave a challenge and I asked him to do a set list of what songs that he would pick if he was going to um, have ACDC, um, if he was going to pick an ACDC set, we all know, like, there's a, you know, so many classic songs that they have to play in the set. Highway to Hell, Hell's Bells, Shook Me All Night Long, but uh, we're going to go a little bit away from that and pick more of our sort of, like, uh, songs that we like. And then um, compare notes. And then compare the two, and let, let, let's talk about why we sort of uh, pick these sort of set. So, yeah, let, we're, we're doing 2021. I'm going to go with, let's go with an opener. So, I've gone here, um, I've gone Riff Raff from the, the Power Age album. I love this riff. I love the energy I think it's a great... They could have, like, the explosions and... I think it's a great opener to get the mosh pit going, to get the crowd going. I haven't heard Brian Johnson sing this song too many times, but so it'll be interesting to see how he, how he sings this riffraff off Power Age. But uh, I've always heard Brian... Uh, obviously, Bon Scott sing it, but I've never actually heard... Brian Johnson sing Riff Raff, so I think that'd be an interesting um, song to hear. Yeah, well, can I can I chime in? So yeah, so what's okay, your opener? My opener is actually I just wrote down two sets of songs I didn't really put okay, in okay, order. Okay, okay, okay. Straight off the top of my head, I put number one, Problem Child. Oh, yes. Um, for the same reason, I actually have Riff Raff at song number eight. Right. So we're both on the same page there. Yes. Uh, I just like Problem Child because it's just a kick-ass song. Just the heaps, energy. Heaps, heaps and heaps, heaps of energy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm the same. I've got Problem Child as number eight. So, <laughs> oh, so, high yeah. five! <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. So we've, got, we've both got Riff Raff and Problem Child uh, in, our, in our sets. So now... Song set. number two. Oh Song number two. Gonna, what's he going to say? Oh. Oh, I can't wait to find out. It's like, are we going to win Lotto here? That's what it's like, <laughs> isn't it? The suspense is killing yeah. me. Get on with it. <laughs> so this is a random one. Very random. Um, so the next one that I've got is Big Gun. And this, oh! this, 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 Did this I put the, that on there? This is the song. I on. thought about it. No, I didn't put it on there. So this is not on any album. No. It was for we the... Played uh, we played that at the pool. Oh, really? Yep. So this was off the last... The Terminator action, uh, Last Action Hero oh, right. movie, soundtrack. Yep. And uh, it had Arnie Schwarzenegger <laughs> in, in the... But again, you can have all like the explosions and the cannons come out. And, and uh, it's high energy. And yeah. uh, I like that song. It's, it's a real good... And uh, you could show you could show like parts of the the film. You could show Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, picking up Angus and you know carrying him into the crowd and whatnot. So um, I think that'd be a good. I actually have 
the Big Gun CD. I borrowed it from a guy called Fitzy from Central Coast Sheet Metal. Uh. I played rugby with him, and I never gave it back. <laughs> It's in a box of my mother's, and I plan to do that one day because he said he came to with me to the Sydney Entertainment Centre to see it. Right, and I never gave it back, not intentionally. Yeah. I think I just never saw him again, and I I never drove over there to um where he worked. So I hope Fitzy, I'll get it back to you one day, mate. <laughs> I've still got it. Okay, so I have Roof Raff and Big Gun. So what's your second song in in the set? Well, as I said in that particular order, but yeah. I had Big Balls because it's comical. Oh. <laughs> now tell us about this. Big Balls for people who are not sort of ACDC. Well, it's on the Dirty Deeds album. Yeah. The original. Uh, the Australian the Australian release. The Australian version. Um, is it on the American one? The Atlantic one? I'm not sure if it is. I don't know. Anyway, I mean, they, so, um, they cut up. They cut off some pretty. They, they cut off a few to combine the two albums. I'm sure it would be. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just think it's a funny song. Down, 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 down. And be, and I say that because it's a song they. You, well, I was watching an interview the other day with Alex Young saying, "Look, a lot of their songs they recorded. They never actually played live. Like one of my favorite songs. It ain't no fun." Or, yeah, I to be a millionaire. No, 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 no. I, don't, I don't think they've ever played that. But I anyway, I put so. Big Balls at number two. Oh, but had I thought about it, I probably wouldn't put it at the second song of the yeah, opening right. song. I just sort of this is what I yeah, was yeah, like. Yeah. Okay, that's got to be on there. You know, that's okay. That's okay. So Big Balls. But speaking of testicles, um, or he's or, got big balls and she's, she's got, got big, big balls. balls. But we've got <laughs> the biggest the balls on the world. <laughs> of course, that you know. Yeah. Some are held for All right. So I have Roof Raff, Big Gun, and then I'm going to go Brian Johnson, mid-90s. Uh, I'm going to go from the title track, uh, Ball Breaker. That's what I've got. Oh, really? Oh, shit. It's number three, Ball Breaker. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, so if, no, for, for, for number one, I had Problem Child, and you had that number eight, and I had that number eight at Riff Raff. Anyway. Wow. We're thinking alike. <laughs> oh, so number three, Ball Breaker. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, great album. I thought. I thought for me, underrated. Underrated, and that was their comeback album after. Yeah. The eighties, which didn't do a lot for me personally. Well, they had the Thunderstruck, but I, I, other than apart the from the Thunderstruck, other than yeah. the Thunderstruck, Raises I don't think edge. they that that didn't. I mean, Thunderstruck was huge, but the Ball Breaker one, I think it was underrated. I, I think. It's a real good bluesy. It's a bluesy album, but it's also got some real good uh, rock rock, and, rock songs as well. Good guitar, I thought really good guitarists mm. from Malcolm and a- Angus. Yeah, songs off that album for me that stick out are like uh, "Cover You in Oil." Hail, yes, "Hail Caesar," um, "Whiskey on the Rocks." Mm. Uh, that that slow gonna... blues one. Um, it's gone off the top of my head. Boogie Man. Boogie Man. Yes. They anyway, I put, I put Ball Breaker number three just as the song. Me too. Wow. And we didn't... We didn't... We, look, did, we didn't talk about this We at didn't all. talk about this at all. We just said put your this top 20 This is pure stuff. fan instinct right here. Wow. All right. So, Riff Raff, Big Gun, Ball Breaker. So, number four, uh, I'm going back to Bon Scott. It's a song that I've heard you play oh, at the Pearl. At the Pearl. Uh, I've got uh, "Girls Got Rhythm" oh. off, off the uh, yep. off the Highway to Hell album. It's just a real groovy sort of song, a real catchy, really easy to sing, um, and you can dance to it and you can mosh to it at yeah. the same time. So, "Girls Got Rhythm," good song, yeah, and good album. Um, I've got this is a bit of a slower one because I wanted to hear them play it live. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of fans would like to hear it. It shouldn't be number four. It should be late in the second set, but it was just something I wrote down because I didn't want to forget about it. Right on. Oh! Dirty they detail. actually have played that. I saw them on YouTube uh, when France won the World Cup. They were playing in Paris or something. Oh, right. And uh, they played their set, and then they come back out for another encore and played right on because that... That's what the France, uh, when they won the World Cup, they yeah. played. They played right on. 
when they want it. Right on. Right on. <laughs> so the, so they, they, the ACDC come out and they all wore, wore the, the French uh, soccer shirt. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, they did that for Scotland when they won the um, soccer back in 78. Yeah, right. Oh, it mightn't be that year, but it's somewhere around that period. They all came out in their Scottish... Uh, Football Gonzies, I should call it. Shouldn't call it soccer. Mm. Football Gonzies. Yeah. So right on. Right on. Oh, that's right an on, old bro. old school. Is that from is Dirty that Deeds? From? Dirty Deeds, right. And it's as far as I know, I could be wrong. I've done a lot of ACDC listing, uh, but I haven't list. I have bought the new album off iTunes, um, and I have listened to it, but not had sat, sat down and listened to the whole thing straight through. But um, I think it's the only song that Phil Rudd plays a ride symbol on right probably because he's not a, it's a, yeah well there might be another one which I have heard but it hasn't gone into my skull uh, number five number five so oh this is a little bit left field uh, I'd, I've never heard them play this one live um, and we we're talking about it before off air um, I really like the uh, for those about to rock album oh yeah I think it's very underrated because Highway to Hell was such a oh sorry Back in Black such a huge it's the biggest one of the biggest albums in it ever where do you go from Back in Black that sold you know 40, 50 million albums um, that's obviously going to go down but I, I think it's a very underrated um, so I picked one off that and uh, Inject the Venom oh yes um, off, off the Those About to Rock album I've never heard them play that song, but again, it's it's got energy, it's got a, a good catchy sort of groove to it, and uh, yeah, one of my favourite songs off that album. Yeah, for me, I remember I got, I was working at Big W, you remember Big W? You used um, to get the cheap CDs there. Yeah, and they had this double CD of, it was Power Age, and For Those About To Rock. So I played those two albums to death, and I think I paid like you know twenty bucks for it or something right. for two CDs, which was cheap back then. Yeah, remember this? Anyway, so um, yeah, good album. Um, I had number five, Jailbreak. Oh, classic! It's just the song. You, I know it's it's kind of been played a lot, um, but it's, for me, it's such an iconic song with Bon Scott and. The film clips are awesome. It's so cool. Yeah. They're all dressed up in the, the convict outfits and uh, Bon Scott's the the uh, the guy like um, running, running the jail. It's so cool. Yeah, that is pretty, that's pretty cool. But that, yeah, iconic part of the history. And, Definitely. And it just shows you how, how, how good songwriters they are. Yes, yes. I mean, just, just technically and structurally. Um, oh, yeah, so jailbreak. Well... I've, I've, again, we're thinking very much the same because I've got Inject the Venom and then my next song is High Voltage. Uh, okay. Going right back to where it all started, uh, the first album. Uh, I think, was it their first, one of their first um, well, releases in Australia? Yeah, I think the first album was called High Voltage, but High Voltage, the song wasn't on there. Right. High Voltage came out on the TNT album. Ah. I don't know why. I can't remember. I can't remember. So maybe, maybe, they, maybe that was the American it. version then. Anyway. But uh, yeah, high voltage. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it's the American version where Yankees is sticking his feet out and he's got his tongue sticking out. That's the Atlantic. Nostalgia, again, it's just a classic, you know, where it all started, you know, going from uh, Brian Johnson to the Bon Scott. You've got to play Bon Scott songs, you know, you got to mix it up. So yeah, yeah. high voltage. What song are we up to? Number six. Uh, that's number six for me. I got a whole lot of Rosie. Come on. That's a tough song to beat. That's, I mean, it's the energy. Um, it's a stable in their set. And it's a classic. And what a title. Yeah. <laughs> isn't Bon Scott, like, isn't Rosie from Tasmania or the something? Tasmanian Devil. And, and everybody used to have a go at her. <laughs> when they, when they, taught, when they taught at Hobart, they'd, they'd all have a go at her. <laughs> She'd be waiting for him outside after a gig or something. I don't know, but I'd like to see a photo of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Now I see. All right. So, um, 
I'm continuing with the Bon Scott era, and uh, this is one that uh, they play off and on. I've heard them play it a couple of times uh, in Sydney. Uh, Bad Boy Boogie off the uh, Let There Be Rock album. Yep. Um, I just like love the gr- I love the lyrics of it. I, I think it's so che- um, uh, cheeky. <laughs> And uh, Bon 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 Scott is just an amazing uh, comical lyricist. Yeah, what's a bad boy boogie? That was my um, my login for Facebook and all that. And and, uh, what what is bad boy boogie? And it's like it's an ACDC song. Oh yeah, sure it is. But yeah, um, I actually have bad boy boogie on my second list. Oh right, I thought you can't you can't really leave that one out. Okay. Alright. So, the next one... Seven. The next one I had, I probably should change this around if we're talking about specific set lists. Hmm. But I put Let There Be Rock. Classic. The guitar solo's in that. Uh, Actually, the guitar solo's in The Whole Lot of Rosie. Now, you've played that song live, right? Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Let There Be Rock. That's a great song. You know the other night, uh, uh, drummer Jill... He broke his snare head. Really? By hitting it too hard during Let Baby Rock. I thought, wow, I that's thought, rock If you're ever going to break your drum, that's the one to do it that's on. That's rock and roll. <laughs> Let there be lights. Let there and be the, band, the band's standing there for a minute going, okay, what do we do? This, we've got no drummer. He's out trying to find a new snare. Yeah. Like, maybe we should do like a comical version of Big Balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So. Remember upper class high society? A yeah. gift to ballroom notoriety. Yeah. Yeah, we'll stop there. But uh, Let There Be Rock, great song. And the film clip's even better. Uh, bon, uh-huh. bon Scott in the church, uh, dressed up as a... Um, priest. As a priest. It's, it's great. You know you know, he broke his leg when he jumped off the, oh, really? the pulpit? Really? Yeah, yeah right. Apparently, the, he, you, you watch it again. He jumps off he, and he lands and he rolls down. He actually broke his leg and they had to take him to a hospital. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's really cool. All right, uh, number eight. Uh, we talked about it before. I had a problem child. Some classic songs. Uh, it's the riff. It's the the energy, um, and it's really cool to to hear those those old. And riff raff is just that whole. That makes you just want to rock and roll. Headbang. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I'd, like I said before, I'd, I'd love to hear Brian Johnson you know, because I know that uh, when uh, Axel was in the band, and I was singing um, Riff Raff. So oh, right. I, I'd, maybe they have, but I've never heard Brian Johnson sing Riff Raff. Have yeah. you? No. No. Two different so, tonally, two yeah. brilliant singers, but um, yeah, I mean, it's very, very. I think he, I think he keeps saying that that that's Bond song that that's Bond song, not mine. He can keep that oh, song. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what well, was good for a laugh? Huh? Yeah, just uh-huh. before we move on. Seventy three, Ryan Johnson. What an amazing test of time that guy. Sad to say that he's amazing. Uh, uh, so number nine. Uh, so number nine, uh, I have uh, off. I think it's off. Dirty Deeds, or maybe it's off TNT. Live Wire. Oh right, that's off TNT. Yeah, and I I noticed that even when they were doing the the high voltage tour, um, Live Wire was their first song. Like that, it was like their opener. All the way up until he passed away. Yeah. Um, and I agree. The whole bass, ding, 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 ding. It's like like the, the, the lights, no lights in the bass. Damn, it's a good start. Damn, man. And then it just kicks in with the with the, the guitar riffs yeah. and drums and away it goes. But yeah, I love that song. It's really cool. So I've got Live Wire. It's I, number nine. I was tempted to put it in. Um, I didn't because we've been playing it so much recently. Right. <laughs> but yeah, good song, and yeah, they played that a lot. I put uh, number nine, Gone Shooting off the Power Age album. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. That's really cool. 
Just a song I'd like to see the band do that you, they'd never really throw. I think they on. have. I think, I think they did for that VHS video. Yes. Thingy, yes. And it fucking kicked ass. Yeah. They did some oh. really cool songs on that, that VHS one. Yeah. Well, that's the only one I've seen on there. Mm. Yeah, that's a cool song. Very good. All right. And the last one for the first set. Ooh, this is this is going to be an interesting one. So, I'm going into mid '80s. Uh, I just don't think some of those albums were like really, like the the mix and the master was just horrible. You, you can't hear the vocals. The um, guitar was horrible. Everything. Yeah. So, um, but I'm going to go with uh, one song off that because they didn't. They never play any songs off that album. Those albums. Uh, I'm gonna go with Sink the Pink. That's what I was thinking. Fly on the wall. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, and and it's just one of the, again one of those songs that's just um, out of all those that era. I think that that's the one that sort of stands out. And that's it's the like, only one that stands out to me. Too. Yeah. It's a pretty cool film. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. 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 Um, I had Sin City. Ooh. I didn't put. I should have put that on there. But. I kind of cheated, and I put three extra songs. All right, give us um, some. So I had Sin City, but I thought I couldn't decide between Hail Caesar and Hard as a Rock off, off of the Ball Breaker album, and then I greedily put, uh, just because I'd like to hear the band play it, Baby Please Don't Go, Ooh. Off, off the very first High vo- Voltage album. But no, if we have... That's, to, that's if, not an ACDC song, that's a cover, right? Yeah, but they made it their own, completely. Yeah. Um, with with Brian Johnson singing, that'd be interesting. Baby, please don't. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Oh, it could be. In, uh, I don't know. I just put. I just want. Yeah, I want to want to hear it. But if I had to cross to ten songs while we're finishing on Sin City. That, that's wow, that's, that's a good. That's one. a good finish. Yeah. So that's uh, set. I'll just go through it again. Riff Raff, Big Gun, Ball Breaker, Girls Got Rhythm, Inject the Venom. High Voltage, Bad Boy Boogie, Problem Child, Live Wire, and Sink, uh, Sink the Pink. I've got Problem Child, Big Balls, Ball Breaker, Ride On, Jailbreak, Hollow Rosie, Let There Be Rock, Riff Raff, Gone Shooting, and Sin City. That's a good set. And uh, the next set, um, I've just pretty much, uh, if you're going to see AC, if you want to go and see ACDC, so the first one, um, obviously, is. Thunderstruck. That's what I had. Uh, <laughs> number, song number one, Thunder, Thunderstruck. Again, we didn't we didn't uh, look we at didn't each other. Collaborate other's. here we behind didn't. the scenes. So the first one, uh, Thunderstruck, uh, when they were playing that off, off the uh, off that tour, um, so much energy. It's a great uh, and w- everyone knows that you know that, yeah. that, that, that that lick with the guitar lick. So. Um, yeah, Thunderstruck, uh, definitely for me, as number one for the second set. Well, I had that too, and here's a funny story. We had Roger, who was singing most of the Brian Johnson stuff mm. at the Pearl. He went missing in action in India for a year because um, because of COVID. Wow. He couldn't come back to China. So he's American, his wife's Chinese, um, got a son here, and um, he got stuck in India for a year. Ended wow. up in Denmark. I think he's just recently come back, but so we haven't been able to do that one recently, um, just because it's a difficult song to sing. But yeah, Thunder Thunderstruck for number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, um, possibly one of the biggest albums ever. Uh, the title track, Back in Black. Uh, it's a classic. The riff. You have to play it if you get if you want to watch ACDC. You want to hear Back in Black. It's a good song, isn't it? I mean, like just to play that song. And feel the energy live, as opposed just to listening to the to the album. Yeah, it's it's really good live. I had number two, just because I wanted to throw it in there. Mm. Um, I thought it was a cool song. It's not an iconic song so much, but stiff upper lip off the uh, stiff stiff good upper lip. Good song. Album. Yeah, I'd like to hear that one live again. Yeah, very bluesy. Yeah, cool guitar riff. And it's different, different. To, it's a slightly yeah. different feel. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Uh, the third one, I've got like two here. Like, um, 
I want to put something from the new, the brand new album that just come out. They haven't toured for it yet. So, my favorite song from the new album is Realize, the first song. All right. Um, so, I've got Realize slash Highway to Hell. Okay. I got High Voltage, but you, ah, you put that in the first set. That's right, yeah. So, we'll pick the same. I think it's a good live song. Yeah. Re- I think Realize is a standout for that. I really like the new album. There's like two or three songs that they definitely have to play when they uh, get back out there and tour. Um, I haven't heard them be... Uh, like, there are so many... Po- Angus said, what's a podcast? <laughs> it is, like, they can't tour, so they're, they're doing all these interviews and they said, you want to do a podcast? Angus said, what's a podcast? <laughs> Hey mate, my it's mother's so my mother's a similar similar age, right? Yeah, she probably asked the same question. Well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so realize slash highway to hell number four, I have uh, TNT. That's what I had. Look at it, the TNT. Get the fuck. This out. keeps happening. It's so TNT. It's uh, you know one of their first big songs. Very explosive. Yeah. <laughs> that was Wait, a joke. Uh, yeah, um, explosive. Um, it was one of their first singles in Australia, and it was huge. And it's got the, the whole toms and the very simple. Oi, oi! Do you know? You think about it, that's a very Australian way of singing. Very, very. Oi! Hey, mate, what the fuck are you doing? Oi! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oi! Yeah. Sit down. How are you? Uh, number five. Uh, I have Jailbreak. I think you've already talked about Jailbreak in yes, your first I have set. That in the first set. Yep. Uh, what did you have? I had another one off the new Power Up album, Demon Fire. Ooh. I haven't... I mean, I've been listening to the songs... That's a riffy... But, one, yeah, riffy. I just thought it was a good one that I'd like to hear live. Mm. Um, so when they do eventually... When they're allowed to tour again... Um, with this, some shows, I'd like to hear that in the set. Yeah. Yeah, that that's going to be... do 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 uh, next one, uh, I think you've also got this one as well. I have a uh, whole lot of Rosie. Yep. Off, off the, uh, Needs no explanation. Let there be rock. What did you have? What song are we on to? Oh, six. Shot in the dark. Ooh. That's off the new album. Uh, new yeah, one? This yeah, new, new album, album as well. Um, I, I like it. I probably wouldn't put it back to back, but I just thought it's got to be in there. Yeah. They're, they're going to play a couple of songs off the new album, obviously. So that's that's the that was the first one from the new album, right? Yep. First single. I think so. I don't remember. Right. Uh, number seven. Um, oh, classic. Hell's Bells. Oh, you, right. You can't... I, I didn't even put that in. But. You can't uh, have an ACDC uh, concert without Hell's Bells. Well, you need the big bell, don't you? That's right. <laughs> It's uh, um, you need the bell, you need the Rosie, the tribute to you need the cannons for those about the rock, the tribute to uh, Bon Scott, ah, uh, yeah, Bon Scott. Um, so yeah, Hell's Bells for me. I had Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be. Come on, yes, it's a rocking song, yeah. Uh, they've, they've played that a couple of times when I've seen them play, and sometimes they some of the kids are just like, Is this a new song? Huh? I haven't heard this one before. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a real groovy sort of song. I like it. Uh, number eight. Uh, I'm sticking with uh, Back in Black. Uh, shook me all that long. Again, you can't uh, go to an ACDC concert without listening to to this one. Well, I had For Those About to Rock, just because oh. there had to be one off that album in there. Sure. And um, The Cannons. But I, I would I didn't think about visually when I was writing down these songs. I was just sort of thinking, okay, what songs would I like to play, or would I like to hear mm. another band play that you might miss necessarily hear all the time? But that one is there all, all, all the time, obviously. But I just thought you can't leave that one out. Well, that's the thing. Like uh, with Brian Johnson uh, in the band, he's been in the band for forty years. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but like uh, when they come out, they don't play high voltage. Uh, jailbreak, uh, those sort of songs. I mean, they got so many songs to choose from. But uh, I think last time they come out to last time I saw them play, they did play uh, high voltage. They play it a fair bit. Yeah, oh, I think. 
But it's like I don't know. Yeah, I don't know we whether to, they, they don't like playing it or something. But yeah, we used to play the same song for forty years. I That's right. Yeah, you know, yeah. And you got like seventeen albums, or whatever. you got a brand new album. From. You got a brand new album. And you're you trying to play that. Yeah. So yeah, Shook Me Not Long for you and for me and for you it was for those bits rock. And uh, rock. Uh, number nine, uh, another classic, Dirty Deeds of of the uh, Dirty Deeds album. Uh, again. I want if I want to see ACDC, if they don't play Dirty Deeds, I'll be very angry. I've seen you guys play it as well. What yeah. happened when you played Dirty Deeds uh, the other night? We were uh, supposed to play TNT. <laughs> <laughs> we got about, I don't know, a minute. Half of the so. band was playing okay, TNT. Me, Half of the band was playing Dirty Deeds. Yeah, okay, was, so the drummer, was fucked, the drummer fucked up because I, they're kind of similar, right? Mm. Um, and the drummer's not really... He didn't sort of grow up listening to ACDC like we did, so he kind of stuffed up because because he has everything written down. But um, and then I followed him subconsciously, and then I've got 10, 20 seconds of the song going, "Fuck, I think I'm supposed to be playing TNT." And then <laughs> and then, and then the, the singer's singing TNT, the bass is kind of coming in and out, and the guitarist is going, well, "I don't know what to do." Yeah. <laughs> And then, and, and then funny enough, another guy comes up over the show and goes, wow, that was really cool. Did you guys rehearse that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, we had a big fight backstage. <laughs> yeah, we rehearsed uh, that one. That's cool. So, um, number nine. For Back in Black I had, which you Ooh. used a couple of songs ago. Can't leave. That's yeah. just a good one. Like, yeah, Back in Black, excellent. The, the whole riff and... And then uh, the last song, which they have done ever since they brought this album out, my number 10 song is For Those About to Rock with the Cannons. I think yeah. that's a perfect way to finish off an ACDC set. Um, what did you have for number 10? I Dog Eat Dog. Oh, oh. good song. Yeah. Off, uh, Let There Be Rock. Let be rock. Um, as a, then, again, I cheated and I went to 12, so 11 I had Bad Boy Boogie. Ah. And, and then twelve, I had Highway to Hell. Ah. So, but yeah, technically ten cut off. Dog eat dog. Very very good. So we will post this in our in the uh, in our, our podcast uh, WeChat, and we'll show our little set lists and of uh, ACDC. But Dave, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Um, good luck with your new album. Come back next time. Really, really love you playing uh, in ACDC, and I love uh, you know listening to your album and seeing you play live. You're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Colin. <laughs> 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 On that note, <laughs> uh, that all right. Note. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, good, to, good mate. See you next time. Okay, let's go for brewski. <laughs> let's do it, brewskis.
타이어가 없는 곳 타이어와 빛나시 I'm Tony Fair, founder of Victorian Grooming Company. Is your beard feeling dry or the skin underneath itchy? Maybe you'd rather soften and tame your beard instead. Our classic collection of beard oils, balms, and soaps will leave your beard looking, feeling, and smelling amazing. And if you prefer shaving, our pre-shave oils and shave soaps will give you a smooth and razor burn free shave. Handmade in Edmonton with natural ingredients, visit victoriangrooming.com. Hi, I'm Nigel the Shanghai Psychic. I can tune into your loved ones in the spirit world, but I can also tune into you, tell you about your path and the choices that you need to make and need to know. I'm currently giving 30% discount on all Tell Craig Your Story listeners. Just use the code Tell Craig Your Story for 30% off your first psychic reading with me online. At Nigel, the Shanghai Psychic.